Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be looking at one of the latest additions of the available direct drive force feedback wheelbase solutions from the guys at MSource, the ET3 wheelbase with a peak torque rating of 10 newton meters. I will be testing it along with the FD1 steering wheel that was included in my kit. Out of the box, this kit looks professionally finished and assembled. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. Let's take a closer look at this ET3 direct drive wheel from the guys at MSource. At least that's what I'm calling it, MSource, because I don't think it's I'm source. Good finish everywhere you look, right out of the box. Yeah, it has a quality appearance to all the finishes, all where everything is located, all the hardware. I can't find any defects anywhere, any sharp edges. So yeah, job well done as far as that goes. Now this is a rather heavy wheel. It comes in at 12 pounds and 12 ounces, and that's 5.78 kilos for everybody else in the world. And it is a peak 10 newton meter rated wheel. And it has an 18 bit controller back here in the electronics package. Now, how big is it? Well, it's not that big. It's only about 152 millimeters from the back of the case back here up to the front of the flange. And then if you go all the way out to the end of our quick release adapter, it comes in at about 245 millimeters. And that would be about nine and a quarter, nine and three quarters inches. And the case itself would come in about right at six inches, just about. Now the height on this is 110 millimeters, I believe. Yes. And that comes in to be about four, four and a quarter inches or so. And it will be the same going across as far as the width is concerned because this is a square casement design. You can see right here. And of course we have a flange on the front, like most servo motors. And this flange does have four holes. They are 92 millimeter centers all the way around, which means they will fit any front mount type of system that I've ever had at the SRG. Definitely will fit in all of those. It is also an M8 hole. And I'll show you the threads they have in there. So this is a threaded hole, which means we don't have to worry about putting a nut on the back and squeezing it to the mount, which is kind of nice. One step you don't have to do when you're mounting it. The hub itself has two screws in it, set screws, or two pairs of set screws. And that's how it's attaching to the shaft of the motor itself. The front of it also has this LED, and that's a motor status indicator tell you if everything's good or something's bad or if you are got some kind of a peak going on with the force feedback. In other words, it's peaking too high. The front of this has a quick release. I call it the NRG type quick release. It has the ball bearing indentations four on the top and five on the bottom. Now on the front here, we see there's no contacts for powering our steering wheel. It's all flat there. There's no contacts. There's no traces. That's because of the way that they use inductive electromagnetic coupling, or what I just say shortly, or in short form, just inductive coupling. <laughs> and other wheels have used this too, from China. But typically their setup has the transmission coil and receiver coil inside of the hub somewhere up close to the front of the motor itself. And then they have some wires coming out that will attach to a plate that's up here that does have some traces or pads where some pins will land and these pins are in the other side of the hub, like over here in this wheel here, the pins would be in here spring loaded and they would press up against those pads and the power can be transmitted. Pretty simple. This is different. They've taken the transmission coil and put it on the very front. That's what that is. You see the plastic, see there's little three screws there. So that's the transmission coil or inductive coupling, and instead of having both of them in here. And on the wheel, and we'll talk about the wheel later, I just want to show you this now, that is the receiving coil. So when this is mounted, obviously, and we have the quick release one there, it's going to be very close to each other, so this will transmit through inductive coupling to this. So that's how we power the wheel. It's also a wireless solution. But the wireless transceiver is not in the front. 
it's just an LED rail. That's not a transceiver. So there's other ones that are mounted in the front here. And then they talk directly to the wheel. Now, the less distance that wireless signal has to travel, it's always a good thing, right? So they've done it differently here also. On the back, might as well go ahead and flip it around the back and show you this. We have an antenna connector. See that? The coax deal. So that's for an antenna. And they supply you with this little nub or stub antenna. 2.4 gigahertz. And you simply put this on, again, a la a semi-cube type of wheel, base. And then you can tighten it up in whatever position you want. So you can actually peek this out to the side if you're having wireless transmission problems. It shows in the instructions to have it mounted straight up and down. Very simple thing to put on, obviously. But you could peek over the side like that if you needed to. You know, wireless is not as good as wired no matter what you're, what you're doing when it comes to this kind of stuff. But, you know, SemiCube ha doesn't have any problem as far as the wireless. I mean, maybe some glitches here and there, but that's the nature of wireless in general. And again, why I say the closer you have the transceivers to each other and receivers, then, yeah, it's going to be a better deal, as you might imagine. Less, less room for interference to degrade the signal. So, back to the back. Now we've talked about that plug. We have a USB plug here and of course that's for connecting to the pc and we have a little light here the usb we have six usb ports now these are actual usb ports there's no can buses on here so they're all able to accept like shifters pedals whatever you want to plug in displays whatever the case may be so i have no way of telling how many amps are available on these but yeah there's only one way to find that i was plugging if it doesn't work too well then plug it into another one it'll probably work better so we also have the DC power supply input. And of course, because that's where the power is coming in, we have our power switch right above that. And this is a two-piece unit. You can see the difference in the light. Well, it's not that much difference, is there? But there is a seam right there. And this is an aluminum cap back here. This is all steel here, right? Because that's where the motor is. What else can we talk about? Not a whole lot here going on. The flange up front here is a 12 millimeter thick flange so it should have plenty of strength for mounting this especially at only 10 newton meters of torque being used here very smooth when it's on the bench as far as turning it which is really not an indication of a good or bad setup to be honest i've actually had stuff on here that was notchy but when i ran it it felt pretty good another way around i couldn't feel anything that was notchy when i turned it on all right so what do you get with this you get this power supply now, this is a switching power supply, so you can use it either in North America or everywhere else in the world. And it has an output of 36 volts, 6 amps, about 216 watts there. And it has their MSOR sticker on here, but on the other side, it has a Gojison logo. And I'm looking for, yeah, there we go. There's an LED for it. It has a thick cable coming out the back. Of course, we have our DC plug. Transmit our power. And we have a molded in large ferrite core there to help mitigate EMI. Not a clip on. We also get a USB B to A cable. This is not a gold plated cable. Seems to be of decent quality. Does have a ferrite core manufactured into the cable, not a clip on. And you get the power cord itself, which this is the wrong one for what I need. This is a 220 volt, but it is an IEC C13 connector, which is very popular or very prominent everywhere you go. And I have a bunch of these or ends that'll do 110 volt that have the C13 plug on the other end. So no big deal for me. I'm assuming that if you order it in the shipping in North America, that they will put this one in there. But if they don't, you're gonna have to source your own. Be advised. Right, that's about it. As far as what's going on with the motor, not a lot to see really here at this point. We just want to get a closer look at the, you know, the build quality. And yeah, I can't find any fault here. I looked at it for a while trying to find nicks and, you know, maybe some deformities or something like that. But yeah, everything looks pretty clean on this. So let's go ahead and get to the next segment. Let's do our look inside segment on the ET3 wheelbase from MSource. Now I've fully disassembled this one. I did a review 
on the ET5 back here. This is a 17 newton meter wheelbase. And it's a little bit longer and bigger than this one at 10 newton meters. But I didn't take the hub off. And there was a question, so I just want to make sure that people understood that it works the same with M-Source. Both of the wheels are doing the same thing. And what's happening here is, because I didn't take the hub off and this wire was hanging off, somebody asked, hey, how does that keep from getting twisted up? So I'm going to explain that now. The Obviously, there's a coil here in the adapter for the quick release. And it's attached to two wires. You can see the wires down in there. Now, this wire starts at one place and ends at another, but it's just a coil in here. Okay, so it just circles in, gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter until it gets to the middle. Now, the current flows to this coil, which induces another current in the receiver coil that's embedded or integrated into the quick release on this wheel. So then it's inductive magnetic coupling that causes that current to flow. That's how we get power to the steering wheel. Well, that's all fine and well, but what about these wires hanging out here? So you got this hub sitting on this motor shaft like this. Let's so get this slide on here. And I didn't take the one off of here because it's pretty stubborn and required a lot of heat. You know, it would take a lot of time and effort to get it off. And usually if they're that stubborn and I'm testing things, I just leave them alone. This one I was able to gently get to come off. So it didn't stick as much as that one did. And you'll get that from wheelbase to wheelbase. It just depends on motor shaft diameter, things like that. Anyway, so the question was, hey, well, how does that keep from getting tangled up if it's connected here and everything's turning? All right, well, we'll pull that off, and you can see on the back here, these wires are going back to another coil. I'll show you the plug down in there. I think you can see a little white plug. So it's getting current flow induced in it and then sending it down the wires to here. Now, because this is obviously another coil, we have another coil embedded in the wheelbase itself around the motor shaft in here. And of course, an electronics package design that will supply the current. So again, it'll, the current will be induced in here and electromagnetically coupled into the coil on the back of the hub, which is transferred to the wires. And then we transfer it over here to our adapter. So this can sit on the on the shaft, let me slide it on here again, and rotate all day long. It's not going to make a difference because, remember, there's no physical connection here for that current flow. So that's how it works. And yes, yeah, so the, obviously the ET5 over here does the exact same thing. I just wasn't showing it in, in that review. So I want to make sure that I got this one off so I could show you guys how that was working. Pretty clever. So we've got a coil, coil, and coil. That's three different coils before we get to the receiver coil over here in the wheel hub. So yeah. So that's how they provide the current to the wheel or the power to the wheel and yeah i think it's pretty clever i like the way they did that it's pretty simple easy to maintain if you have to take this off and do some repairs to it maybe not so easy on this it looks like we'd have to take the i don't know it might come out if i take these three screws out here this plate may slide out but there's going to be some wires back there obviously that are going back to the electronics package sitting in the back of the wheel motor right so we'll look at that, obviously, in a minute here. But yeah, pretty simple the way this goes together. I think it's a good design. Anytime you can have electromagnetic coupling, you don't have to worry about wires getting twisted and things like that. It is a good thing. So what we'll do next is go around to the back and take a look inside there. All right, so I've got the back cover off the motor itself. You can see we have a nice circuit board in here. Very clean looking. Nice, clean layout. Just top of the line professional type of circuit design it looks like to me i don't have schematics so i can't tell for sure but it looks very good to me and just from driving it i can tell it does a good job now first thing you'll see is these three wires three phase motors so that's why you see these three power wires going in here to the motor itself we have some filtering or smoothing capacitors in here because this is where the power comes in and we have the power switch over there too so typically you'll see some larger capacitors in here to kind of smooth things out when you turn the power on and off things like that we have a couple of large inductors in here and we also have let's just do this one first this cover over here, this metal cover this is the transceiver unit for the wireless solution it has a little piece here that clips onto it and that's the antenna wire you'll see looping down under here it goes through the circuit board and attaches to our coaxial interface for our antenna on the other side over here Right, in the middle, you see this white circle here, and that's where the position sensing is done. 
that's how they're controlling what this motor is doing. And you can see this chip here that actually can sense magnetic fields or the changes in magnetic fields. Now over here on the motor shaft, we'll turn this over this way a little bit. This has a cap on it with some set screws holding it on. You can see those two set screws there. And then a very powerful magnet right there. And it's pretty powerful. I can take my wrench and you can hold it up. So that's got a pretty good power to it. Now, as this turns, of course, the orientation of the magnetic fields in this magnet will change. Our little sensor over here can sense that. And that's how everything works. So this sensor will tell these power wires what to do as far as moving the motor back and forth for our force feedback. Pretty clean, a very simple type, and there's no encoder involved here. Yeah, so no resolvers and things like that. They're in other motors. But yeah, I've seen this in this type of motor. I think it's in Magic is the same thing. Uh, the Moza, I believe, is too. Same kind of sensing. So yeah, it's very effective, obviously, because it works. And yeah, I can't find many things to complain about here. Now, this little set of wires here plugs into the circuit board over here. And this goes to the front through a hollow piece in here to the motor in the front. Now, it also has a ferrite little core in here, and it's a ring that they've wrapped the wires, looped them around, and that helps mitigate EMI interference. So it's nice they went a little extra step and didn't just run the wires without that. I like when I see these kind of things. And of course, those wires, like I said before, are servicing our coil and electronics package up here that's doing the coupling, electromagnetic coupling to the coil that's in the hub that we saw a second ago, right? To get the current to flow so we can power our steering wheel. So yeah, I guess that's about it as far as what you, you want to see in something like this. Very clean. You know, I'm looking for stuff to complain about here, but I think it's a well done package. Let's take a closer look at this M-Source FD1 steering wheel. This is the one that they sent me with their ET5 and ET3 wheelbases for testing. And yeah, round wheel. It has a leather grip all the way around. Kind of has a pebble grain to it. Let's see that in the lights. It looks pretty good. Feels good in hand. No real con Nothing to really complain about here. 320 millimeters across here. And the grip itself is 106 millimeters in diameter. So where you, wherever you grab it at, that's what it'll be. Has some thumb indentations up here. It feels very stiff in hand on the bench. So there's really hardly any flex to this thing at all. In fact, most of the flex might be in the cushioning that's inside of the grip here. So yeah, no complaints there. The stitching, I went all the way around this wheel, checking out the stitching, kind of bright yellow, <laughs> but yeah, there's no defects in it. No thread sticking out, no mist, stitch, things like that. Things that I look for that give me an indication of what kind of quality control they're using in the production of the wheel itself. The spokes here are aluminum and they have that brushed look to them. They have another aluminum cap on top. The spokes themselves are four millimeters thick. The button plate on front, we have carbon fiber that is sitting inside of a, imagine a little lip, recessed lip all the way around the aluminum housing. We'll go to the back in a minute. And we have obviously the controls on the front here. This is a button that has a guard all the way around it. You see those tall guards on the buttons. When you push the button, it just feels like a button push. There is no tactile click or anything like that. It just bottoms out. So really nothing special going on there. They don't seem to be moving back and forth much at all. They are lit. You can see these letters on there. They will light up. And we'll see if we can see that once we get to the end of this. The pieces on top, This I like this. As you, If you've ever looked at my other reviews, I really love these seven-way switches. They're calling this a four-way. But it's really one up, down, left, right, and then we have an encoder. It feels very good, actually. This encoder is very tactile. Little teeny indentations, but very tactile when you turn it. And we have a push button. And we have an analog slash button piece here. And this is like a hat switch, right? So it just moves around in circles. But it does have a button push to it. And there is a little bit of a tactile feel to that, just like this one up here. Definitely more tactile feel than any of the buttons down here. 
Yeah, and this is also a mode selection type thing going on with this and this piece over here, but we'll go through that once we have the wheel mounted and running. Got some LEDs on the top for some RPM indicators. The encoders on the bottom go all the way around. There's no stop points on them. And these actually do have good tactile feedback to it. Good indentations. I mean, you can go to grab this and get two real quick. And note you got two. Or three. So, yeah. This is very tactile. No push button on it. Both of them feel the same. I like a good tight rotary, and that's what these are. So, yeah. I'm just getting too many in SRG on wheels that they're loose. The shafts are loose. You can move them around. These move a little bit, but you've know, got to have a little lash in that shaft when it goes into the main housing of the the rotary down there but yeah very tight relative to others that I've had yeah so no complaints there either let's look around the back here all right so we have an aluminum housing here everything is chamfered again no defects in the finish that I can find anywhere we have shifters and accesses on this so we can do use a clutch or you can use it for Handbrake, whatever you want to, to sign up what you want to in game. The shifters themselves, magnetic, a short pull. That doesn't go very far, but it is tactile. Yeah. Shifters are fine. I would not have any problem using these shifters. Not crazy about when they put the pluses and the minuses in them. It's just a personal thing, though, very subjective. You know, it's aesthetics. <laughs> I don't really see any reason for it, but yeah, there it is. Now, these are three millimeter thick carbon fiber paddles, and they are mounted onto these aluminum, five millimeter thick aluminum arms that are part of the shifter housing itself. This is all aluminum, aluminum here, and we do have some adjustments on each one of these paddles. You can see the slots there. So we can adjust this in or out, and you can because they're slots, we can actually tilt this a little bit as long as you don't interfere with the clutch paddle on the bottom. And if you really want to do something with the tilt, you know, if you don't use the clutch paddles, you could always take them off if you needed to. So we have a magnet up here for the shifter. We have springs in here for the analog axis paddles. Show you the spring under there. Pretty simple setup, nothing too complicated. And I believe these are contactless switches inside of the wheel, but we'll see once we get inside and take a look at them. But yeah, I got no complaints about the way these shifters feel. I could use these all day long. Yeah. And again, these springs in here are not too heavy. And I'm going to have to get in game and use them before I can really make a distinction of whether I think that they're stiff enough. Because, you know, in a clutch release, you want to pop one loose. But one, you want to be able to regulate all the way out as you get your second stage of your clutch release. And... I found personally a little bit stiffer spring is easier for me to adjust as I'm coming out on the pressure. So it gives me more of a feel what's going on. This is acceptable, but then again, you really won't know until it's mounted. What else can we talk about? Quick release. And this is the, again, NRG type that's going to fit on the front of the wheelbase itself over here. And of course, inside of here, you see there are no pins, like in a lot of these type of wheels that would transfer the power from the wheelbase over there to the wheel itself. This has instead the inductive electromagnetic coupling system. Electromagnetic coupling, or I just call it coupling. <laughs> so this is the receiver coil in here and the transmitter coils at the very end of the quick release for the wheelbase side. A different way to do it. And again, that makes it contactless also at the same time, pretty neat. The communication is also wireless, so it'll talk wirelessly to our wheelbase over here. If you saw the wheelbase part of this or segment of this review, you know that. And we also have a USB-C. Gotta love finally getting some USB-Cs out here. And it's not just another mini, <laughs> or micro, rather, micros, which are fine. They work, but still, the C is better because you don't have to worry about which way you're turning it. Now, what I'm going to do is... And we can use this, the whole wheel, through here. This is also firmware updates or upgrades. And we can also use this to run the wheel. If you're having a problem with your wireless environment, then you can just go ahead and put the cable in 
and plug the cable, actually. And you probably saw this if you saw the closer look on the wheelbase into one of these USB ports. So you don't have very far to go with the cable, which is a good thing because the cable's not that long. Well, it's, long, it's not what I would call long for a, a you know a simulator. I mean, it's not that long. So you probably have to use some kind of an extension. It looks to be about a meter long at that. So that's what I'm going to do now real quick. I'm going to go ahead and turn my this light off. Okay. And then I'm going to plug it in. Let's see if we can see what these lights do when we plug it in, which will be the same thing as if you connect it to the wheelbase itself. Now I got a, a C cable already hooked up. So I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. And let's see what we get on this thing. There we go. Okay. So it goes through a boot up routine apparently, but then it does not light the lights. It might light them once I have it attached to the wheel though. It might be because it's not attached to the wheel that they're not going to light up. Who knows how the firmware is written for this. All right. So we'll go ahead and do that one more time. I don't know if you heard that little beep, but it actually has an audible beep. <laughs> All right, go ahead and unplug this. Get our lights back on. And we also get a manual. Manual out here. And it tells you, of course, how you can tune this or what to do as far as setting things up. Decent little manual. It was easy to figure out how we change modes for like buttons and switches on here or what we're doing with the clutches. But we'll cover all that later on when we have it mounted and up and running. So yeah, that's about it for the FD1 wheel from the guys at MSource. Let's take a look inside of this FD1 wheel from the guys at MSource. First, we'll look at the electronics package. It is attached to a two millimeter thick carbon plate. And we have some countersunk holes here on the bottom and on the top up here. And that's for mounting this to our housing over here. We'll take a closer look at that in a minute. Of course, all the buttons and everything are attached to this. And again, soldered to the circuit board. You can see all the pins poking through there and they did their soldering. I looked through the soldering. I couldn't find any defects, anything that would set off alarm bells or anything that would be worth showing you. Say, hey, look at this. I think I could have done that better. <laughs> so everything looks pretty clean there. We have a surface mount USB-C connector and also the reset switch is also circuit mounted. In the middle, we have a plug and that is for the wires that come out of this hub and plug this in and it powers the whole board. And of course, that is the result of the inductive coupling we're using in the system that's in the hub of the wheelbase and the hub or the quick release hub over there on, on the housing. And we'll take a look at that again in a, in a minute. Didn't have any glitches for that, so everything worked well. Uh, it's neat that they have, instead of just putting the LEDs on here and just regular sleeves, clear sleeves, they have actually alternated between a dark or black sleeve and the clear ones. So what that does is it allows these, to, these LEDs to be lit up, but there's no light bleed between them because there's a black housing in between each one of the clear ones. And even the black ones have a LED in them. So all those are LEDs. So it's nice they went the extra mile to do that so they don't get any bleed over. And it also makes the LEDs nice and bright, which they are on this wheel, no doubt. What else can we talk about? Clean looking circuit board. Yeah, I don't have any complaints about that. Well done there. The wire that you see going up here is going up to a plate that has some traces in it. It forms an antenna or functions as an antenna. You can see that there. And as that wire goes back down, it goes over this way. And that's where we hit the transceiver of the wireless transceiver. And I'll kind of tilt this up. You can see it in that way. There we go. So that metal box in there, that's our wireless transceiver. And this antenna is attached to that. And I'll show you this view here, give you a better look at it. You can see it's just a little clip on there. Never had any problems with the wireless, so I really can't complain about this setup. If it, I had glitches or anything, then maybe I could say, well, maybe they should have taken the transceiver and put the antenna on the outside or something. <laughs> but this seems to work quite well. Yeah. So really, yeah, no complaints here. We got a couple of plugs on the sides here, and that's for our shifters over here on each side. That's for the shifter cluster. 
with the clutches. Anything else we're going to look at here? I guess that's pretty much it. Again, very clean. Not much. Yeah, I really can't find anything to complain about here. Just professionally done. And of course, it has passed the quality control. The little green sticker there. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at the housing. And the housing itself has a lip around the perimeter of it. A little indentation there. You guys can see that. That's where that carbon fiber plate drops down into it and then fits nice and flush with the rest of the plate here. And of course, these are the wires coming from our shifters, our shifter cluster, if you will, because it has a clutch in it also, our analog axes. So you can actually replace these. You can see we have two bolts on the bottom and on the top. You can pull those off and the whole thing will slide out. You can also unclip the plug in there if you need to. So that's on either side. And of course, this is the receiver coil. Again, we were talking about that magnetic coupling that we we're using for inducting a current through this so that we get power to this plug, which again, powers the board. So yeah, uh, we got some nice standoffs machined into this. Very thick. Of course, they're threaded. And this is where the wheel bolts go. And five of these, there's not six, there's only five. Because there's a hole here that's going to the quick release segment back there that's also, again, housing that coil for the magnetic coupling for induction. Yeah, very clean unit here. Really, again, it's hard to find any problems with it. These little holes here are for the carbon fiber. We had the countersunk holes that you saw on that plate. And we have some little teeny screws that go in there that are flatheads, and they go up here also to secure it. So, yeah, not much else to see here. Clean. Yeah. I can't really complain about anything. I don't know about you guys. It's a well-done job here, I think. It's nice and tight. It's kind of a friction fit almost. So it wasn't that easy to get it out, which is always a good thing, I think, as long as it's not glued. <laughs> they have this cover that goes on the top of our plate. You put in two bolts in the plate that go into the housing, and then you put your cover over that and put three more in, or a total of five, so the cover will fit on there like that. That's a nice little beveled unit. It's four millimeters thick, and it's got... It's Kind of like a etching on here. It's not a, a decal or anything as far as the logo. Very clean all the way through. Yeah. And again, another thing I always look at, if you noticed on this, there is no place where they didn't get the coating done. The anodization is nice and uniform throughout the package. Yeah. So I guess that's about it as far as the look inside. The wheel itself, kind of a generic looking wheel once we pull it off. It's a pretty stiff wheel. When I was driving it, I really had no complaints about flex or anything. And even the quick release system that works over there, it was pretty tight also. So I really couldn't get any flex that I could tell was there when I was actually driving this thing. So a nice stiff wheel. There's always going to be some flex here. Once it's mounted, you can take your hand and pull it back and forth. But that's because obviously we have no support for this part of the rim except over here. And yeah, there is a, a radius to it which helps support it a little bit. But still... When you grab it down here in the 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock position, that there's just really no perceived flex in the wheel, except for the grip itself, which has some cushioning in it. All right, so there we have it. The look inside for our FD1 wheel from the guys at M-Source. Let's take a look at the M-Source optional mounting bracket that you can get with your motor. As far as I know, this does not come with your motor. You have to order it separately. I don't know what the price is, but this is what it looks like. It's a three millimeter thick piece of steel, kind of a stamp steel thing going on here that's bent up on the sides. The front holes are 92 millimeter centers, of course, so that they match the flanges holes. And we have two little access holes here for, if you look on the front of these, in the both of their motors the same way, they have these little M3 or M2 little holes up top there. It looks like you could mount a dash or some kind of a display maybe. So they have access holes on the front, but not the bottom, or rather the top, but not the bottom. And this will fit right on here like this. It'll fit the raised area. The whole part has been cut to fit this raised area that comes off that flange. See it right there. And we have where the LED is located. We'll go ahead and set that on top. See how it fits. All right, fits pretty well. Kind of hold it here because it's going to want to fall around. But there you go. It's a pretty good fit from the side view there. I think that's acceptable. 
Now, to mount this to something flat, you can mount it to whatever surface you want. We have our little side flanges here. And these have long slots for this part of the mount, mounting it to a flat surface. And they have an M5 slot to them, it looks like to me. And now we have a, instead of just a slot here for your angle adjustment, they have a series of holes, nine of them, that they've drilled into here, which I like. I prefer this over just a slot. Now, it does take away, of course, there's, you know, there's always compromises. It takes away some of the millimeter by millimeter rake adjustment you can have with a slot, but it certainly is more secure once you put a bolt through there and cinch it down. There's no way for this to move. So it's going to be stiffer feeling, a more firm feel to the wheelbase in general when you're using it instead of having it in a slot, even though it's not moving in a slot. I can move most slots. You know, I can put enough torque on them to make them slide if I really want to. Unless, again, there's, there's some kind of a fixture involved that won't let it do that. But yeah, overall, I prefer this. These are six millimeter centers here, so that'll be six millimeters of angle adjustment you have on the motor. Of course, it's all subjective. Depends on what you want to do. And on the back, that's our pivot bolt there. And I'll go ahead and put one of these on here just to check it out. Now, we're going to use these six millimeter button head five mil, or M5, rather, <laughs> six millimeter long. And I'm going to put one in the back in the pivot hole first. Get that started. Get it started. <laughs> oh, there it is. It wasn't on the hole. Story of my life. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to put this to where it's what I would call flat. Yeah, that's it right there. Put this one in. We'll use our handy four millimeter wrench they provide. Go ahead and Snug that up just a little bit. So yeah, that's going to be very solid. Now I didn't tighten it all the way down. You can hear it clicking around a little bit in there. But once this is cinched down, there's no way for this bolt to move past to another hole, no matter how much you put on this. I suppose you could eventually rip that out, but it would take a lot more force than if it was just a slot is the point. So that's going to be very sturdy. Now, this is sitting up a bit in the air. So when this flange is mounted flat to something, right? You can see it's still going to have the motor floating up in the air there. It's something on observation I like to make. Now you can put this on any flat surface. A lot of cockpits come with flat wheel decks that you can mount you know, different hole patterns in them already that you can mount things to. So you should be able to find a pattern for these. If not, you can always drill your own, right? And they also provide you some hardware to mount to profile, 4080 profile. And I'm going to show you the flange spacing here and other profiles too, not just 4080, I would imagine. So there's 4080. You can see there's plenty of room there to mount a bolt and still slide it around and make some adjustments if you need them. This is also provided with this setup. We have these 5 millimeter, six, not 5 millimeter, M5, 16 millimeter long, socket head cap bolts and they give you these little t-nut slot kind of t-nut i guess you could call it a nut and it goes on like that now this is not for a 40 series though because if i put this in a 40 series profile it spins around quite freely and that's not it's supposed to lock up onto the sides of the channels and you can see it's not doing that it's kind of spinning around but maybe a 20 series is what this is for i don't have any 20 series i can't verify but yeah, not a 40 or a 15 series for sure. But you can buy your own little nuts that would fit whatever profile you have. So you just have to source those. And you can still use the existing M5 socket head cap bolts. Also, they give you these nuts, M5, serrated edges on them. So that bites down into the metal when you tighten it down. That usually locks on pretty well when you use these type of nuts. It's going to mar the finish though, whatever you crank this down on. We also get some washers and I have one on one of these M8 bolts here. This is an M8 bolt. Again a button head. It's going to obviously go into the flange and we have some black metal washers that come with that. And we also have some black metal washers for our M5 bolts right here. So that's what's in the kit when you get it. And yeah, I'm not going to use this. Like I said before, I'm going to be using a front mount on this and we'll get to that next. Now I'll show you how I'll be mounting my M-Source ET3 motor. 
I'll be using a front mount bracket back here. I'll show you what that looks like. Now this is kind of a universal bracket that comes with my cockpit. And it has slots in it. And it will accommodate a lot of different size motors. Midge motors, uh, semi-cubes, the Mozas, the Sim Magics. You know, all that stuff fits in here. And these guys do too. So a 92 millimeter center is what we have on the pattern on the flange of that motor back there. And it's going to fit like a champ because it's actually very close to what my Cold Morgan is. Now, typically what I'll do here, first off, I got to consider that my front plate here is 15 millimeters thick. The flange on my motor back here is 12 millimeters thick. So that means I need to get a good seat down in this flange, a 12 millimeter thick flange right here. And it has some threads in it. So we don't have to worry about putting a nut on the back and then tightening everything down. We're just going to make it simpler for us during the installation process. Now, that's 27 millimeters of reach I need on my bolt. And a little bit hanging out of the back is not going to make a difference, right? So I have these guys, and these are mine. The bolts that don't come with this as far as just the motor. Now, if you get their option of motor mount, it does have some bolts for it. But, yeah, these are 30 millimeters long. Socket head cap unit's very strong. We'll get the job done. Let's put a washer on there. Because we're putting it in slots in this front plate, I like to have a washer on there just to make sure I get good grip on that slot because it's not real tight around this bolt here. It's close enough, but not real tight, which is good because you do need some wiggle room sometimes to match the holes up. So what I typically do is, now I could hold this up because we have threads in it and don't have a nut on the back, so I don't have to have a nut and then a bolt and trying to do it with two hands. If you got a helper, it's no big deal, but I typically do not have one here at the SRG. But yeah, we don't have to worry about that. We can just screw it straight in. So I could just go ahead and mount this and then hold the motor up and then put the bolts in while it's already mounted to my cockpit, which is a little problematic because it's going to be moving around in those slots, right? Once I get one bolt in, so it's doable, obviously. I like to just go ahead and mount it on the bench and then take the whole assembly over there and then slide it down into my wheelbase uprights, tighten it up and done. Of course, everybody's a little different how they want to do that. So what I'll usually do is just tilt this up like so. I'll bring my bracket in and then set it down on top of it. But here I have a problem. <laughs> this motor is the smaller motor that M-Source makes, so it's a little bit short. No big deal. We are ready for these kind of things here at the SRG shop. I just take out my four by four salt treated piece of wood here. And I've got these in like six by six, eight by eight. So I use them for a lot of things for jacking things up and stuff. In fact, I think I've already split this one a little bit from jacking on it. <laughs> so anyway, just sit this down however you want to, as long as it's stable, put it like this. There you go. And we'll go ahead and put this closer here so we can see what's going on. Then I'll take the bracket, position it on top. I'm going to be careful how I put this on because I don't want to scratch up the flange if at all possible. Just one of the things that I like to do. I like to take care of my equipment. So we'll take one of our bolts. And it's easy, obviously, at this point because nothing's, I'm not having to hold anything from moving around while I'm putting these bolts and getting them started. And I'll just kind of look down where the flange is. Go ahead and put these in. And once I have these in, I don't want to get them real tight straight off because I'm going to be moving them around or moving this bracket around a little bit, trying to get it squared up. So I'll just go ahead and use my fingers to run them down real quick here. And then I'll take a look. Just kind of looking straight down here. And I'm looking for these back, the gaps in these slots. There's going to be a little gap around every one of them. So I just want the gaps all to look the same. And if they do look the same, chances are very good that it's going to be lined up. Make sure everything's good and loose here as I'm sliding these around. And you to be careful again. I don't want to scratch up the flange on the motor, if at all possible. And I'm also looking down at the flat of the motor and making sure that these pieces up here and here, depending on your angle, look flat also because I don't want it twisted. But if you line these grooves up or these slots up on the spacing on them, it should be centered. So that looks good to me. And again, I'll just finger tighten it right now. I'll come back with a proper torque wrench or Allen wrench and tighten them all down. And then take the whole assembly, like I said, over there is one piece, drop it into wheelbase upright profiles, and then tighten them down and I'm done. So when we come back, 
we'll see how that went. So this is the final mounting solution for our ET3 wheelbase from M-Source. We've got our FD1 steering wheel attached. All our LEDs are adjusted where we want them to be. Go ahead and swing around here. Now, you can see here on these bolts, there is some space. You can see a little air through them there on either side, but it is centered. And as you can see, it fits fine, just like we saw on the other mounting segment. It's rather nicely in this front mount bracket that we have. And we'll go around the other side. And we've got our antenna all set up. Everything's ready to go. So yeah, all we have to do now is get in and start having some fun. So we're in M platform. We're going to do a quick little live tuning session to see what these sliders do. And we might as well just go ahead and get out on the track and see what's going on with the wheel from the default configuration. Now I have the wheel maxed out pretty well as far as the torques all the way up to 10 as you can see up there and also i have 23 newton meters dialed in for the force for the wheel and of course it's set at max force of 10 newton meters in the game and right out of the box it doesn't feel too bad at these settings there is a little bit of notchiness around the center as you're turning the car run over some bumps here it's a lot of detail but there is some notchiness. Depending on how much detail you have usually determines how much notchiness you're going to get when you're turning the wheel. Something that I try to completely dial out, and it's not possible to do that very often. Sometimes I can get the wheel down to its very, very faint, and at race pace you can't feel it. But right now you definitely feel it here. It's not real obtrusive, but it's there. And that's something I try to get out because it feels more natural or like a real car analog, if you will, when you're turning the wheel and there is no notchiness as you're going back and forth. If you had that in a real car, then you better check your rack and the steering because you've got something wrong in there. It shouldn't be doing that. All right. So first thing I want to do is try to get rid of this notchiness. And we have all these sliders up here. Of course, I've got maximum torque at 10. Speed limit is 40. First thing I'm going to do is pull this detail enhancer down to four and see what happens there. So we're not going to have as much detail. Yeah, and already, yep. Already there's less of it notchiness around the center. Still some there, but not as prominent. So detail enhancer, and I'm getting good detail going across these surface changes transitioning there I can feel that but I am going to go back I'm going to leave detail enhancer there because you don't want to take too much detail out because then you don't you're not comfortable with the detail you have speed limit is 40 taking it down to 30 yeah hmm that changed it there's still there's still that uh, ripple in the as you're turning the wheel though. That's usually the first thing I try to eliminate, if it's possible, and, and maintain the level of detail that I personally prefer. And remember, as we're doing this, all of this stuff is subjective. It's, you know, just because I like something certainly doesn't mean that you're gonna like it. So I always say that in these reviews, no matter who's doing the review, take it all with a grain of salt, no matter what they're reviewing really, because you know once you have it in hand yourself, you're gonna discover things that just weren't covered in the review or you just didn't notice in the review and not only that you but you might not even like what they're doing as far as when you do it on your wheel all right so we took the detail down there's still a little bit of ripple in there or, or notchiness i think i can get most of that out though because i'm reducing it going over some bumps here bumps there and we have a good rumble strip over here on this right hand turn coming out to the back stretch and that's pretty good there. So what else can we do, do you think? Well, I've got dynamic damping. Now that was set at four. I had the ET5 review before I did this review and I had that turned down pretty good. I'm gonna take that down two notches and see what that does. Wow. Hold on. 
That feels really good around center now. I mean, if I focus on it, there's the faintest amount. Just barely some of that notching. I mean, just barely. In fact, I'm not, I'm, I think I'm feeling it. <laughs> so let's go ahead down to turn 17 here and let's, at speed, and we'll go over some bumps, and that'll let me know. What's really going on? Yeah, that feels pretty good. Yeah, that feels... Yeah. Now we'll go down the straight. There's a lot of bumps here. Hold the wheel straight, and you can feel the bumps hitting the suspension. That feels pretty good. Wow. So, the damping effect brought in some of the notchiness, apparently. Because when I turn that down two clicks, it's gone. Yeah, I can't really feel it anymore. Now, the only question is, <laughs> now when you're taking dynamic damping off, that's giving you more detail at the same time. So this is not normally what happens when I'm dealing with detail and then damping. It's always a dance there. There's, you know, there's always some kind of a compromise. More detail gives you more artifacts, if you will, because all the details are turned up and artifacts are like the, the notchiness or ripple. Uh, what do you want to call that? Cogging, torque, cogging, torque, ripple, whatever. But it's just very smooth now compared to where it was. And I'm getting good detail across here. So what else do we want to play with here? That was pretty good. Let me go over this again. That feels pretty good. So, yeah. Damping's off. Let me put some inertia in the wheel. Maybe that'll bring some weight into it. I've got it turned all the way up, so let me put 10 clicks of uh, inertia in here and see how that feels. Inertia should give me some more weight to the wheel. And right away, yeah, I can tell there's a little bit more there. And it bought some of the notchiness back. <laughs> Not much, but I can feel it there. Let's see. Yeah. Bringing the inertia in is getting the, a little bit of the, it's not much. And again, this is all, like I said, ha I, really hard to convey to you guys on video what I mean by not much. There's still a little bit there, but yeah, bringing that inertia up did not do it any favors. So I'm going to bring it back down to zero. Bring it to zero. There it is. And let's test that real quick. Yeah, right away. It smoothed out again. Hmm. So how can we get... So we've got dynamic damping. We took that out, which gave us good... This really good rumble strip right there as we go over that. I usually clip this corner a little bit here so that's nice and sharp but not digital sharp it's not like a again i always use the analogy of like a metal hammer tapping on the motor to give you that the feel of bumps and whatever you're supposed to be getting as far as the telemetry coming from the motor itself and a rubber mallet and rubber mallet feels more analogish and the the metal would be more digital so right now it's feeling pretty good so if i pull up the detail enhancer. I'm going to bring that back up to four. Because I see how far I can push this detail without getting those that notchiness around center. Okay, so that was up. There's just a faintness of the notchiness now. Very faint. All right, okay, so let's go down here to 17. Go around here. At speed. Let's see what we got. That's pretty good. Still smooth around the center as far as at race pace like this. All I'm feeling is what's going on with the texture on the road right now. And it's not sharp, which would give me that feeling of like a digital interface. Of course, there's, I'd like to have more power, but it's 10 newton meters peak, so it is what it is.
Dude, that's feeling really good, actually. So we put some more detail in. Let's go up here. That's decent detail for 10 newton meters. I mean, you're only going to get so much. It's going to feel completely different than when I did the review of their other wheel, their ET5. Because, you know, we've got 17 newton meters, which is a big difference between 10 and 17. With the same wheel on it, the FD1 wheel, which weighs the same and everything. So that's going to have a, its own dampening effect, if you will, when you're running the car. I have to say, I'm, for as much power as I can get out of this, it's good rumbles there. Not as amplified as I'd like it, but, you know, like I said, not much I can do about that. That was good. Okay. Well, that was easy. I think I've gotten pretty much what I had before when I was running the, the cars because I always get in and test these things first just to get a, a general idea of what's going on. Let's see what we have for... Uh, see if we can make this thing oscillate. I'm pretty sure I can. Yeah, it'll oscillate. But then again, if you're racing, you shouldn't have both hands off the wheel anyway. So if it's... One hand can keep it from doing that, then that's fine with me because I'd rather have the detail to get the oscillation to calm down. Typically, you turn the detail down or put more damping in, which is kind of the same thing, but a different way of doing it. All right, so I'm pretty happy with this. Wow. Now, when I'm turning, it's very smooth. Like I'm turning through here, all I'm feeling is the bumps, and that's what all you should be feeling. You shouldn't be able to, you shouldn't be feeling some kind of a, a notchiness as you're doing this turn. Right here, that's smooth. There's nothing there. Just barely, barely, if I'm feeling for it. But yeah, at race pace, I can't feel anything. It just feels very smooth. Just like their ET5 wheel, you know, I, I was able to get that very smooth around center. Which, not many wheels I can do that, that to dial up the detail and still have that smoothness around center. In fact, we're going to push it till I can feel it again. How about that? See how far we can do this. I think I found what I want, though. Put it about five. A little bit more. See what that brings us. Mm. Yeah, now, now it's, it's kind of back now. It's, it's, to me, it's noticeable. Yeah. So we're right at the limit. Let's see what that did for the detail. Let's go with some bumps. Go over some curves here. Yeah, that's that's too much. Yeah, just the, the little notches and hits that you're getting, the little ones, they feel like the metal hammer's back. So that was too much. We pushed it too far. So we can't get any more detail out of it than that. Uh, speed limit down to 30. I'm going to pull that down. Let's go down to 10. Make a big move here and see what happens. See if that does anything good or bad. Well, we're still smooth around the center. That actually enhanced that rumble strip there, I think. You would think less speed would be less enhancement. Let's go over the strip this time. That actually feels pretty good on the stri rumble strips. But, again, th there's some ripple. You know, some of that uh, notchiness is coming back, but we can really feel a lot of detail now. Hmm. And that's a, this is going to be a hard decision to make. Let me get up to speed here and see what it feels like when I'm just running through 17. 17 is a great corner to take its speed to feel what's going on with the force feedback. Here we go. Yeah. And the straight's got a lot of little bumps. Yeah, it's just a little bit too much. Let's go through here. Yeah, I can feel it now when I'm turning. When I'm turning and I have the G4, the suspension loaded up, of course, the, the wheel's telling me that. Yeah, it's just a little bit too much there. So that was a big move, though, down to 10. I'm going to take it back up to around 20 or so. See what it does there. 
Maybe we can find a happy, a happy medium here. Okay, so, yep. The notchiness is still there, very faint. But let's see what else is... I don't know, it's still feeling about the same to me. And it feels like some artifacts are in it or something. Yeah, it's, it's not good. All right. So I was up at 40. Let's take it back to 30. Maybe that's the magic place. All right. Okay, smoothness is back, so that's good. I tell you, not many wheels I test can I get it to feel the way I want to. Again, very subjective. Get the detail I want, but get rid of that notchiness when you're turning. And there's none right there. That's good. That might be a... Hmm... Still some there. Yeah. When I'm doing this, I can feel that notchiness. So let's go back to 40. Well, let's do 35. <laughs> I'm trying to... Um, the further I get towards 40 again, the more incremental I want to get. Because <laughs> it's good smooth. It feels smooth here. Around the center when I'm turning it. It's just I don't want that notchiness when I'm turning. And you're going to get some hits, some suspension hits when you turn, obviously, but it's different than that, just a, a steady notchiness when you turn. Yes, it's still, some of it's still there. Jump the curb. Well, okay. Good detail. You know, there's... That's really good detail in the rumples with it there. Still got that a little bit of notchiness, but not, I could live with this. This would have to be a something I probably have to live with this for a while and see what's you know where I prefer it. Because if I go back to forty, go through seventeen. Yeah, it's still a little bit digital feeling. Interesting. That speed would have that kind of effect on it. First, I'm not sure what that actual filter is doing, but okay, I'm back to smooth now completely. Where we were before at 40, but what did that do to my detail? I'm still getting some decent detail on the bumps coming across the straight here. Let's just leave it in fourth. Pretty good there. Good rumble there. Smooth here. Okay, so this is good. From 35 to 40 makes a, a bit of a difference for sure. No doubt. Okay, I'm probably where I'm going to end up. Again, I'd, I'd like to have more power overall. Ten newton meters is definitely a lot less than 17. And... It, the num a lot more difference between them, I think, than the numbers would indicate. Just seven newton meter. But you got to remember, I'm coming from a 25 newton meter wheel, so it's, you know, have to have to keep all that in perspective when I'm saying stuff like that. Yeah, this is pretty good. I'm not getting the, the big ripples when I'm turning. It's smooth. There's still a little bit there when I'm going down the straights, but you got to remember there's also some bumps in these straights too. It's not real smooth. I usually go over to the ring also and do some runs there to fine tune it because I'd probably change it for the ring maybe, or it might be a great setting for the ring. But these bumps, you know, the, the rumbles feel so good at this point that I'm willing to live with. I mean, there's a little bit there. So... I think that's where I'm going to end up. Detail enhancer. I could turn that down. We turned uh, inherent damping. Let me play with that. Let me go ahead and put that up to... Let's leave dynamic damping out of it. Let's go bring that up to 15. Put a little bit in. and see what kind of difference that makes. Okay. It's smoother around center now. But I guarantee you I've lost some detail by doing that.
but does it feel like what I want it to feel like as far as more of an analogish or natural feeling wheel? And yeah, I have to say it does. But I can definitely see that, tell that I've lost some detail. Been taken down a, a notch. But it's a lot smoother. So again, it's, it's always a compromise when it comes to this stuff. Except for one wheel that I own. And I, I got that one to where, yeah, it just feels really good. <laughs> but that's a whole different class of wheel. Or wheel base, if you will. That feels, this is feeling pretty good, actually. Feels very smooth when I'm turning through like this, but I still have the bumps. Good, pretty decent rumble there, but just not as sharp. I'm thinking um, I might actually leave that there. I think I pretty much got it where I, I would use it day to day if I owned the wheel and that's all I used was this one. This would probably be a good way to start any configuration on any track, any car I'm using. Because it, it's got a nice smoothness across when I'm turning it now, when I'm going into turns like that. And that's what I personally look for to give me a realistic feel. Because if it's notchy when you're turning through turns, I mean, you're going to get little hits, obviously, because there's bumps going on in the turn. But, or the corners. But those feel pretty good. These little notches I'm hitting here on these curbings and rumbles. So I still got that, but it's, yeah, it's good enough, I think. <laughs> you can really get uh, wishy-washy when you're testing this stuff. Oh, no! I, looks like I shortcutted the... And they, wow. It penalized me a whole second for that, like, tenth of a second cut. <laughs> All right. Typical hour racing, though. And we do have some oscillation. Not much, though. That damping really stepped in, didn't it? All right. Come through here one more time. I won't get this too long on this. Yeah, that's pretty good. I'd like to have a little bit more detail, but you know, I think I also got to remember this is only a 10 newton meter peak wheel, so I have to manage my expectations properly when I'm using something that's a lot less power than I'm normally used to. It's not easy for me to use something that's not as much power and still try to figure out what it's doing. But after, you know, spending a few hours with it like I have, you readjust to the less power. But yeah, this is this is pretty good right here. I think this is probably where I would end up. I might tweak it up there again where we were just doing as far as damping or detail. In between, back and forth, back and forth, one, two, one, two. V very minor adjustments now to try to get a fine tune. And you can only do that. You can only even attempt to do that when you've got hours on the wheel and you know, you're know you gonna try something different just because you wanna try something different and you might be pleasantly surprised or bitterly disappointed, <laughs> depending on what you end up with when you start adjusting it again. But I think this is what I would use. So I'll take a screenshot of this, and this is probably my compromise. I may come back on the dampening and live with a little bit of the notchiness around center to get the detail, a little bit more detail in there. But again, it's always a judgment call, and it depends on what you can tolerate more less detail or more detail in other artifacts. Pretty much that sums it up, I think. All right, so we were successful as far as finding a good setting, at least as good as I think that this wheel has to offer at a 10 newton meter wheel. And, you know, I have to say, M-Source has done a very good job of getting these smaller motors, and 15 is not that small in, as far as the ET5, but still it's our 17 newton meters. But it's, it, they're good, at, they've gotten good at getting this thing smooth around center and that might not be important to everyone that again it's very subjective but it is to me because it feels like i'm really in a car when i'm driving and you know if you're in a car a track car you should not have some ripples going on when you're turning into corners and things you should not have it and there's just the faintest amount of it right now when i'm doing it slow like this but at race pace i can't even feel it so i, I like what i have right now I think I'm uh, probably going to leave it here for a while. And again, I might tweak it one or two if I change a track. If I go over the ring, which I'm going to do, 
but I'm not going to uh, video that except for just in my driving segment. And there, it's the smoother track overall. And Sebring's pretty bumpy just about everywhere. And that will also maybe change. I might be able to dial up a little more detail or leave it where it is, and the detail will be enough with a smoother track. And I don't have to change anything. I've seen where I've had, I could do that. But anyway, there it is. That's our driving or rather live tuning segment. Successfully got the wheel to where I, I think it's best for me. It may not be best for someone else, but yeah, you have to go with what works for you at the end of the day. We're in iRacing at Sebring and we are in the Ferrari 488 GT3 Legacy car. All right, going around turn 17 here with our 10 newton meter peak ET5 wheel. I was able to get this dialed in, and if you watch the live tuning session, which is kind of long because I was just having some fun doing it, I was able to get this wheel to do what I could with their other wheel that I reviewed previously, the ET5. I could get this thing to feel really smooth around center when I'm turning it. In other words, I can get the detail I want turned up to where I want it, the detail to give me enough information that makes me comfortable driving the car. It makes it predictable when I'm making inputs or corrections in the wheel. And of course, once it's predictable and I know what it's going to do, then that just makes me more consistent with my lap times. And really, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, being consistent in lap times. So even though I had it smooth around the center, there's still, if I'm going slow, and I'm doing that in the live tuning session, if I focus and I'm turning it left and right on the track, I can feel just a hint of it still there. But at race pace like this, it just disappears. It's just gone. And it's very smooth feeling. Now, I'm still getting the detail I want, but I'm getting a little bit too much detail on some of the hits that I get around curbings and things like that. It still feels a little digital there to me. Now, here we go with the compromise when it comes to force feedback, direct drive wheels. I can get rid of that and make those hits feel more like a smooth hit, like you would feel in a real suspension. Of course, unless you hit the suspension bumper, which means you're bottoming out the suspension travel, whatever that's set at. So once you hit that, that's pretty harsh, but it's still a rubber bump. Yeah, it feels a little bit digital, like it's too sharp. Like, a, again, my analogy I like to use is if there's somebody tapping on the motor shaft on this motor, with a metal hammer versus a rubber hammer, that's the difference between analog and digital. And it might not work for everybody, that analogy, but that's the best I could come up with when I'm thinking about it. I was able to get the smoothness I wanted and the detail I wanted, but on the fringes, you know, when I'm hitting the curbing and stuff, it still did not feel, it felt digital. You know, it was a little bit too sharp, a little bit too intense. And to get rid of that meant I would have to turn down the detail too far to where I didn't feel comfortable controlling the car. And again, we're all different on what that is as far as being comfortable in controlling the car and the car is predictable as far as what the wheel is telling us what's going on with the suspension. And that's just one of the things that you have to figure out for yourself. The good thing is the M-Source software, I am platform or M platform, has enough adjustments that I was able to tune it to where I was comfortable with the wheel, just like I said before. And it's not easy for me to get a direct drive wheel to do that. And it feels, again, analogish around center now when I'm driving, which is really where I want to be. It just feels smooth. Again, the, it's a little bit harsh on the, the bigger bumps, but on smaller bumps, it feels good too. So I found my little comfort zone in there. And I'm willing to put up with a little bit of that digital bump on the harder bumps to get what I have when I'm not going over the harder bumps or the you know, the curbings and things like that. But everybody has to find their own sweet spot for that. And, but the important thing, like I said, I think the software has enough adjustability that it can deliver that to you. And that's really, at the end of the day, what we're after. Now, 10 newton meters. Um, let's talk about the power. You know, we got wheels out there that'll do, direct drive wheels, rather, that will do 8 newton meter. We got them 9 meter, 10. Uh, I think there might be a 12 or a 13 out there, 15, 20, 25, 30. You can even buy a bigger motor if you want, if you're doing a, a do-it-yourself type deal. How much torque is enough? How much is too much? And that's going to be completely up to the person that is testing it and using it. If you're coming from Logitech Thrustmaster, a belt-driven Fanatec or something like that, then, yeah, 10 newton meters is going to be 
feeling pretty good to you, I think. But if you're coming from something that you've been using that has more power, it just feels a little bit, I'm wanting more when I'm driving this wheel, I guess is the point I'm trying to get to. For me personally, I drive a 25 newton meter wheel. I don't always drive it at 25 newton meter peak. I'll, I can cut it down to 22, 21, maybe even 20. But you have to be careful when you're cutting down wheels as far as the power, because those wheels were designed to operate within certain levels of torque. And if you turn it down too far, it starts feeling pretty much like crap because it's, you know, it's like taking this Ferrari right here and it's, let's say it's got 550 horsepower and I put a fuel map and I turn a fuel map on this thing that gives it 250 or 275 horsepower. I take it back on the same circuit. It's going to feel pretty crappy, right? Because it's not operating within its optimal window. And these higher torque wheels are designed to be run at higher torque. So you can't just take one, a 20 newton meter wheel chop it down to 10 newton meters and think that that's going to feel good forget it it's, it's going to feel pretty crappy it's just not going to have the the authority and the smoothness of delivery it's going to be, become very pingy when you're feeling things as far as the the force feedback now because i'm maxing out a 10 newton meter peak wheel then it, i don't get that so it was meant to be run at this power level so i'm operating it within its peak parameter if you will and that matters when you're doing these drivings when you're doing these cars like this with yeah it's just one of those things that you have to get in and determine what your power levels are if you're coming from something that only has eight newton meters and there is even a direct drive wheel out there that's just eight newton meters and I'm, I'm not sure i always wondered about that because you know the belt drive wheels can do eight newton meters sure it's going to have more detail but yeah i mean why don't they just go ahead and make it a nine or a ten or something like that so i think ten would be a sweet spot for somebody coming from a belt drive wheel, maybe even nine, something like that. Again, everybody feels the stuff differently. So I'm just telling you what I'm thinking and my opinion of it for whatever it's worth. <laughs> but yeah, I'm having a good time with this wheel because it's smooth around center. Anytime I can get a, a direct drive wheel base to do that, then I'm a happy guy. Um, again, still some artifacts from that feel digital and some of the bumps, the more heavier bumps, but I can live with that if I'm smooth around the center on most of the track. The FD1 steering wheel is doing a good job here. I didn't have any problems with it. Out of the box, the right hand shifter was not working properly, but then I calibrated in the M platform software and it worked fine from there on. Never had another glitch. So if you get one of these type of wheels or any wheel for that matter, if they do have a calibration routine, you should go ahead and run it anyway on a new wheel just for the heck of it. Even everything's working right, just go ahead and run it. It doesn't hurt. And that way you know everything's calibrated the way it should be and the car or rather the wheel is going to perform at its peak so what else can we talk about here adjustable leds on the wheel it's a firm wheel it's not flexy at all it feels pretty stiff quick release just like on their et5 system it's a good quick release system it's very stiff i didn't sense any flex in it so i can't complain about any flex there the shifters themselves work very well very snappy it's easy to come down from like six gear to first gear just bang 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 five shifts real quick in repetition you're there and yeah again everything works i'd like to see another seven way if i was going to complain about something or add a, a wish list to this because instead of that analog switch that they have up on the upper left hand corner that we can make a switch i mean we can make it do four different switches in the software but yeah Another seven way like they have on the right side up there next to the RPM LEDs. Yeah, that would be nice to give us some, some more stuff to work with. But again, I'm just nitpicking here, trying to find something to complain about. Overall, yeah, the wheel gets the job done. These are new guys on the block, M-Source. Obviously they've done their homework. They, it's a good complete package, I think overall. I think the software is good. I think their motor is, whatever they're using here for their motor is doing a good job as far as delivering the force feedback even though again 10 newton meters is a bit weak for me but i was able to adapt just like you can adapt to just about anything after a period of time but i have to say i was happy to get back to my regular wheel <laughs> but again this is all subjective at that point so yeah really nothing to complain about here they've done their homework and it shows i think
Final thoughts on the ET3 wheelbase kit from the guys at M-Source. Out of the box, the wheelbase and FD1 steering wheel present as professionally finished products. I could find no defects in part fitment or finish. The ET3 wheelbase has a peak torque rating of 10 newton meters, which will be good for most sim racers' needs, although I personally prefer a wheelbase with more. The wheelbase hub has a wireless pass-through setup that uses inductive coupling to provide power to the FD1 steering wheel. The data transfer from the button plate to the wheelbase is handled by a 2.4 GHz wireless solution. The back of the wheelbase has ports and connections for the 2.4 GHz antenna, power, USB connectivity, and a power switch. It also has a 6-port USB configuration that allows you to connect supported controllers to it. The FD1 wheel attaches to the hub with an NRG-style quick release, which provided me with a stiff connection point. It displayed no noticeable flex during my testing sessions. The rim on the FD1 also provided a properly stiff feel. The buttons, encoders, and 7-way switch all had a decent feel to them. The encoders, analog 4-way switch, and clutch paddles can be programmed for different functionality in the M-Platform tuning application. Even the button LED colors can be changed. The M-Platform app did provide me with enough tuning options to get the force feedback set up to my liking, at least up to the limitations of what this wheelbase can provide. Speaking of which, I can add this wheelbase to my very short list of wheelbases I've tested that is able to give me a smooth feel as I turn right and left around the center of the wheel's rotation at my preferred levels of force feedback detail. Usually I have to settle for a compromise of more detail and a notchy feeling wheel during the wheel's rotation, or less than desired force feedback detail and a smoother feel during the wheel's rotation. That said, I could still feel a very faint bit of ripple or notchiness around the center, but I had to focus on it to feel it was there. During normal racing pace, it was not noticeable. Also, the ET3 still displayed a bit of digital feel on the suspension when running over larger bumps and curbings, but less than other wheel bases I've tested with similar specifications. There are several distributors that carry the M Source line. At the date of this review, I calculated the ET3 with the FD1 steering wheel to be around $1,200 plus shipping. It's great to see even more direct drive force feedback wheelbase solutions coming available to sim racers. But at the same time, it's becoming even harder to decide which one is right for your particular situation and driving style. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.